This is Binghamton Now on News Radio 1290, WNBF Binghamton, and WNBF.com. When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Aloe or Allbirds or Skims, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and brilliant marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. Nobody does selling better than Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret? With ShopPay that boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning way less Carts going abandoned and way more sales going. So if you're into growing your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell whatever your customers are scrolling or strolling on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout Skims uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash try to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash try. I'm Bob Joseph. This is Binghamton Now for Wednesday, September 25th, 2024. It's live. It's local. It's three hours of America's best radio. Go ahead, give us a call. 607-772-1290. We welcome you to Binghamton Now, where we stay focused on the important topics of Binghamton and beyond. If you have things to talk about, we are here for you. We serve the community. That is our goal. And we do it, especially with uh, this program, providing information, occasional opinions, and sometimes topics that you are not going to hear elsewhere. Sometimes you hear something on Binghamton Now first, and then you start to hear about it elsewhere. So if you have things you'd like to share, we are always Welcome, a uh, welcoming to you at 607-772-1290. Traffic note, as you heard from Don Morgan a few minutes ago, there is a ramp closure on Route 17 in Tioga County. It's the on-ramp to Route 17 westbound at the Appalachian Interchange. So if you intend to go west, young man or young woman or young person, uh, you may have to enter 17 West at exit 65 in a Wego or at exit 67 Vestal. And that ramp probably will be closed till 5 p.m. today. Let's hit the phones at 9-12. Good morning. WNBF, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Beverly from the town of Dickinson. Hi, Beverly. Uh, I feel a little better, Bob, but I'm not, you know, I I feel a little better, but not not enough to go out. Well, I'm glad you're heading in the right direction, and basically my... Uh, prescription for you is uh, plenty of rest, plenty of fluids, and stay tuned to Binghamton now until noon. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I got a, I got the flu shot, and I got the RSV sh- shot too, and that kind, that kind of got me, uh, where my, where, where I was dizzy for. Oh, I don't know, about 10 minutes. But right. I, I feel a little better. Now. But but I just like to tell my friends, be careful when you get that RSV because it's very potent. <laughs> yeah, I think they're using some powerful, powerful uh, ingredients in that, probably some of the most powerful ingredients ever used. So, yes, use only as directed. Yeah, well, well they gave me one... Uh, 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 floor, one in the flu shot in one arm and the other one in another arm. Mm. Maybe I should have wait, waited and, and spaced them. Yeah, that's what I would you do. Know? I think that I, I, I don't think I want to get 
two or three jabs at the same time. I think I, I want one jab at a time. Yeah, well, I, like I said, it didn't bother me yesterday, you know, but it's, it's bothered me a little today. Of course, I, I was going to go someplace, but I'm planting myself and my, and my aid will be coming pretty soon. So, so right. I won't be alone for a while. All right. Well, I hope you'll both listen to the program together because we have some interesting things coming up. Okay. Okay, Bob. Have a good day. You too, Beverly. It's 914 at WNBF. You're listening to the WNBF family. We appreciate our contributors. If you listen or call the program, you are part of the WNBF family. And we always wish you the very best every day. The forecast. Everybody says, Bob, you ought to give the weather because research shows everybody cares about the weather. That's why now more than ever, you see more weather everywhere. It used to be, remember Bob Buchanan, he did the weather. It was about two minutes. He would tell us the weather for Binghamton, the weather for New York and Pennsylvania. And then, as always, he would say, as far as the nation is concerned... And I would reply to no one in particular, the nation, Bob, is not concerned. And then the weather was over. But now, more than ever, the weather is a critical part of your existence. So here we go, the forecast. From the National Weather Service, cloudy today with a chance of showers, high 64. Showers with thunderstorms possible tonight, low 61. Tomorrow, showers and possibly a thunderstorm, high 72. Friday, partly sunny, high 74. And right now, in downtown Binghamton, it's 59 at WNBF 15 Celsius. It's 916. Good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is James from Binghamton. Morning, James. Hi, how are you? I, uh, coffee hasn't really kicked in yet. I don't, I don't have much of substance today. Um, but, like, I tuned in yesterday, at least in the first hour, and you weren't there. I mean, where, where'd you go? It was some guy talking. It sounded like a national radio thing. And oh, the red eye guys. Yeah, I, I decided. In the morning? Yeah, I, de- I decided that, that uh, Gary McNamara and Eric Harley deserve to have an extra hour of broadcasting. Well, I know. It seems to be that that's what goes in. The, I mean, well, first and foremost, Bob, like. Were you in at all in the morning, or were you out, or did I should I have tuned in later? You I, should have tuned know. in early because I filled in Monday and Tuesday for Don oh, Morgan. So okay, right. here's here's uh, this is inside That's baseball. So, but this is yeah. this is uh, just due to operational requirements. Uh, if if I am in for Don Morgan from six to nine on First News Binghamton, then you will hear Red Eye Radio from nine to ten, and then. The most important broadcast in the world will begin one hour delayed. But um, today, yeah, today we're back to uh, gotcha, a full, gotcha. so full. You weren't no. You you weren't out for an eyebrow waxing or anything. N- no, I wish. I, well, uh, well, no. Listen, it just it, it just reminded me to get around to asking you about about something that pops up, especially when you're on vacation and you you seem to have a knack for taking vacation when important things happen. Um, uh, but like what, I mean, I, I, listen, I, you know, that I know the kind of business you work in. So I, you know, that I know probably what the answer is, but like, Bob, for the listeners at home, what, is there not a, a guest host? Is there not somebody who could fill in from time to time? Maybe we should work on crowdsourcing, you know, like, I agree. Like, no, you know, I, I, I fully calls? agree not, that this program, yeah. this program is so important to the community that we ought to have. Either a regular guest host. Remember when Johnny Carson went on vacation, they usually had a regular guest host. I think for a while, I don't know if Letterman was a regular guest host and then Leno. But, yeah, I think this program is so important to America that if it were up to me, I would appoint a regular guest host so we could always have a live local program, even if it isn't up to the usual high standards that people have come to expect from the primary host but still it would be it would and and some people would say yeah it might not be up to the usual standards of the regular host it would be better so but uh yeah to your point 
I, I do believe, I mean, whether it's a, a local program like Binghamton Now or any other program on radio or TV, if it's about current events and opinions surrounding current events, mm-hmm. in my opinion, having a, a regular host, who would you nominate? Well, uh, you know, I, well, I didn't want to volunteer or anything, but, you know, I... Yeah. Well, there, I, by the way, I, I there's would, another thing about... Well, that's what I'm saying. Why don't you do, like, uh, remember when ESPN did the dream job bit sure. like, 20 years ago? Like, and, and, and I remember this because I was a student, and one of my other students was on that show and ended up winning it. I ended up working for ESPN for quite a while, actually, but... Um, Who, Carl no, Ravitch? Like, like, no. Bill no, Pita? Um, um, Skip uh, Church? No, uh, Anish, I believe is who it was. Oh, I okay. remember his last name. Oh. He, he was there. He he never made it to like the A team, but he was definitely like you'd hear him on college football or in the right. Studio well, let's years. face it, you make it to to any part of ESPN that is a big accomplishment. Maybe I mean yeah, but like it's crazy now. This now if we want to do this conversation now, I'm waking up. Um, you know this the 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 advent of the streaming age and the subcontracting out of regional sports services to where you've got ESPN plus offering like 150 football games, you know, there are far more, you know, there's a lot of mediocre to bad commentating going on out there because it's just, there's only so many, you know, and, and to fill up the best of the best. And there's so much content out there. It's, it's crazy. I mean, a lot of times they're leaning on like universities that have their own like programs where students are involved, which is great. But um, yeah, I, now I think about it, it'd probably be almost easier now to go get a job commentating sports uh, than it would have been 25 years ago. It's just that you, you, you're going to feel like you're you're working the graveyard shift at like the packing plant. You know, sometimes with some of the, a lot of those times you don't even travel. They're like just stay in your stay in your house, put a little green screen up, and we'll put a thing behind you. And you know, once once COVID hit, like and they realized, oh, these these middling games where people have the sound off for the most time because it's up on a screen at like a casino. Like we we can get away with somebody not even being there to call the game. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, no, you should have competition. Uh, we 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 should have like some of the regular callers or or guests volunteer uh, to 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 compete to like be your uh, in your fill in host rotation and like come in and we can like we'll do like half hour hosting and like based on that audition, uh, if we haven't been kicked off for some of the things we've said, you know. Uh, yeah, and there you go. That, that, well, that, who knows? That, Maybe it could be sort of like a talent search, so they could finally locate someone who can be the next permanent host of Binghamton. Now, that might be it might be uh, in everyone's best interest. Well, Nick, well, there's a difference between talent, uh, which would be somebody like uh, you know myself, or like I don't know, Carol coming in and 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 having a good old hoot and holler in time with the with the with the guests, but. You know what sets you and your show apart is is the is the journalism that still exists and the fact that you can get most interviews of consequence and anybody who doesn't it's just because they're dodging you because they they don't want to be subjected to to actual journalism. They they don't want to deal with the tough questions. You know it is interesting to note and someday maybe we can come up with a list of the top five people who used to be happy to be on the program, and then when the questions started to get a little too tough, then suddenly they they decided they would no longer participate, which, you know, every no matter what you do in life, whether it's hosting a radio show or coming on a radio show, you have to make your own decision what's in your best interest. But I think, I think the listeners can close their eyes and, and think back over the last 13 years, those who were... Very happy to participate at first when, when the questions were more predictable and where, shall we say, potential controversies were not as, not as likely. And then suddenly people who were regular fixtures on the program suddenly it's like, well, we don't dislike you, Bob, but we're starting to catch flack from people about your questions sometimes i think they, they, actually i think some of the people have been pressured that personally if if it were up to them only if they didn't have to they have to answer to anyone else they'd be like sure bob we'll come on because we love we love the show we love giving out actual information and we don't care if there's a controversy because we think having the facts out there 
are more important. In fact, that, that helps to resolve some controversies. But I think sometimes they get pressure from various sources not to appear. So just a theory. But appreciate your call. Thank you so much. WNBF, this is the station that does serve the nation. And by the way, we also serve Canada, Mexico, and more than a 100 other nations. So if you're part of the global community, WNBF is here to serve you. All are welcome. Everybody is able to listen to WNBF on the app or online at WNBF.com. It's 924. Today is Wednesday. Bob Joseph on Binghamton Now. My solar... And it's Wednesday morning, so much is going on, and we are here for you with news on air and online at WNBF.com. If you ever need a local news update, go to WNBF.com. They say it's where news breaks first, and I agree. There's some local reporting. If you like to see some local stories from someone who actually was born here, has always lived here and continues to have this insatiable curiosity about almost everything to the point where I ask a few questions everywhere I go. Well, take a look at some of the stories. WNBF.com. Get your kicks on Route 962J. Everyone's talking about it. The DOT is now acknowledging the iconic Route 962J. And I know you're saying, why in the past have they been reluctant to talk about the mysteries of 962J. It's a long story. Someday when we have an expanded edition of Binghamton Now, I might be able to explain it to you. Anyway, here is the official information. Thank you, Governor Hochul, for making this possible. The DOT says the on-ramp from 962J to the more boring Route 17 westbound expressway in Appalachian is closed today, closed till 5 p.m. This is not a test, and it is not a drill. This is the real thing. Please brace yourself for the closure, continued closure, of the on-ramp from 962J to 17 westbound. They should have that reopened by 5 p.m. today. Paving operations are currently underway. Please... Do not try to distract the workers. They're conducting very important and precise paving operations even now. 9.53 at WNBF. Let's go to the phones and see who we have. Good morning, WNBF. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Good morning, Bob. It's Gary on the west side. So I'd like to uh, talk about the Press and Sun Bulletin. Uh, a few weeks back, you had a gentleman on who uh, they they canceled his weekly uh, article and said that they were going to have more local news in the newspaper. So I, I subscribe. Uh, I don't get the physical paper copy, but I do get it on the Internet. And I and I must say that I doubted them when they said that, but I've been looking, and in my opinion, they have been having more local news in there. Uh, you know, it was stories that normally weren't in there, now they're putting them in. You know, that poor guy that died in that uh, car accident early in the morning on the weekend where and it was a road rage incident. You know, you would never see an article about that. But now they got an article about him, you know, his life and stuff like that. So I think they have picked up the local coverage lately. Do you think they picked it up, Bob? Well, I know they say they're uh, trying to, so I commend them for the work they do. Yeah, I mean, I think... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the biggest... You, Gary, you would be hard-pressed to find somebody who is a bigger supporter of our newspaper. I, I've i been a supporter of the newspaper for uh, for decades. So I, I commend them. I, I commend the reporters they have. I commend their editor. I commend the sports writers. I commend those who still get up early to deliver the paper. I think they are fighting the good fight. 
I'm on their side. I will go, I would be willing to go to Gannett headquarters to lobby on behalf of our Binghamton newspaper. That's how strongly I feel about this. And you're still a paper guy, huh? Well, I don't subscribe to it anymore, but... Um, oh, oh, you stopped. Well, I stopped, and uh, here's here's the short... I'm going to try to give this as briefly as possible. So at one point, they claimed they were going to give me a discount because I thought, you know, I've been paying thousands of dollars over the last, oh, half century, and I thought, well, maybe, because I support them so much, maybe it's time for me to check into... Discounts, And they said, sure, Bob, we'll give you a discount because we love you. Obviously, that part I'm making up. But we'll give you a discount for the next two months. We will allow you to get your fresh copy of the Press and Sun Bulletin six days a week for $15 a month. I mean, obviously, it was um, you know a promotional program for two months. And I said, I think that's nice. And I think after supporting the paper for uh, years... With my hard-earned dollars, thousands of dollars, I think a two-month discount isn't bad. And I was looking forward to it. And so when the bill arrived, instead of getting the discount for $15, I was, like, excited. You know how you usually get bills in the mail and you're never excited? This time I was so excited. I ripped it open like a madman, like a maniac. I was looking. You didn't even use a letter opener. I didn't. I think I got a little paper cut in my pinky. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, okay, obviously I'm embellishing. So anyway, so I open up the envelope fully expecting to say, here, dude, pay your bill by whatever, September 15th, and uh, it's only $15. I thought, well, that's what I'm going to say. No, instead, instead of the usual $45 being reduced to 15 instead of the discount, they raised it to $57. And I said, I can't take it anymore. I, I, at that point, Gary. Per month, wow. Per month. Yeah. Jeez. And it's like, again, because I was so, I they had whipped me into a journalistic frenzy by thinking I could get two months of America's best newspaper on this, you know, just promotional and then go back to the usual rate. And instead of getting... The discount that they said they'd give me, fifteen dollars for two months, it was fifty seven dollars. I, I said, well, what is that eight hundred number? And then I called because it was late on a Friday, and they said, oh, that service cannot be handled or can only be handled in business hours. So obviously they didn't want to accept a cancellation over the phone without somebody, some counselor to advise you that you really need your paper, which I really do. I mean, you know, I've been going through withdrawal for the last couple of weeks without my paper, but I had to do it not because I dislike the Binghamton paper or the Binghamton Press and Sun Bulletin. I love it. But because Gannett decided not to follow through on their side, this is a corporate decision to not give me the $15 a month discount and instead raise the price by twelve dollars a month. I I thought I had to do. You know, it was the pain. It was a painful thing. I never thought I would live to see the day where I wouldn't be subscribing to my hometown paper. It's you didn't go to the internet. Oh, I did. Ultimately, I did. No, so, so I you thought got the internet. Copy. Oh, then, okay. well, so what? Oh no, I don't get the internet copy. So I went on Saturday morning because I was thinking, gee, if I wait till Monday for the office to reopen and the 800 number to be staffed, they'll probably have a counselor who will change my mind and get me, you know, to stay on for another three months with a promotional and discount. Give you a discount. Yeah. yeah, and apologize and say it was just a, a mistake, which it probably was. And I thought, no, I don't want to be talked out of it because it, it, I'm too vulnerable. They will talk me out of it. So... I guess I guess around 11:52 on Saturday morning I went online and I pushed the button and it said are you sure and I had to push yeah and so there there I am and I'm inconsolable I'm you know no local paper but again it's not my fault they pushed me over the brink Doesn't WNBF pay for a paper for No <laughs> We don't have that kind of what do you 
Who do you think we are? Money. That kind of we money. have no money. Oh, gosh. <laughs> broke. I was going to say, we have no money. You know, wow. the media, all media, this is tough time for media. So anyway, long story, but, you know, I missed my paper. So, but I support them. I support them. Thank you so much for your call. Yeah, I, I love what they do. And you know, someday I'll, I'll re-up. It's 10 o'clock, WNBF. Joining us now in the studio is Assemblywoman Donna Lopardo. Good morning. Hi there. Nice to be here. Well, welcome back. Mm-hmm. Anything going on in New York? All kinds of things going on. Really? You pick it, you name it, we've got it going on. Do you realize the election is 41 days away? I do. I do. There's, those big elections are basically taking up a lot of attention. Presidential, congressional. Yeah. But So what's it like? You're running for re-election to the state assembly, uh-huh. a seat you've held for a long time. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me, in the current media infrastructure, most people, when it comes to politics, are focused on the presidential race. It seems that wherever I go, somebody has an opinion about you-know-who or you-know-who. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, of course, everybody will weigh in on the presidential race. But I hear very few people talking about, say, assembly races or state senate races or other local races. Yeah, it's difficult to break through. That's why I mentioned that those the race, the big races, especially presidential, but certainly Congress, too, on TV, are dominating the airwaves. They've purchased up most of the commercials, it turns out. And well, and, and that's the thing. So for the next 41 days, yes. we're going to be treated... To you know who, what I like about the congressional candidates is they both now, the current batch of commercials, and look, I, both of the candidates have been in the studio. I, I like, I like both of them. Sure. They're, they're very, they're always interesting to interview. But what I take away from their current commercials on TV is they both know how to drive cars. So, so the, what, what I saw with Mark Molinero's commercial is he only, it only shows him driving his car. Like in the final three or four seconds, mm-hmm. but the Josh Riley commercial shows him mostly, I think, 23 or 24 seconds driving the car. And then, because he's talking. To his child in the back Yeah, seat. but at first you don't know it's his kid. I thought it was like um, a reporter or somebody, sure. you know, uh-huh. me doing an interview. <laughs> and then he, uh, the camera shows, reveals that his son is in the back seat and his son says something to the effect, all right. Dad, just drive and let's let's go to the playground or whatever. And, and that's what and they said, do. Yeah, there but, you go. And so I I just like the commercials. I I could watch them without the sound, just you know, muted. And the, yeah. the commercials are 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 fun. I think a lot of people do zip through them though. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially at this point. And your to your point about the because any TV or radio station has only a certain amount of inventory that's for right. commercials. And I gotta say. For the Binghamton TV stations and the other stations in this congressional district, mm-hmm. imagine they're virtually sold out through November 5th. I mean, they're rake, don't tell anyone, they're raking in millions and millions of dollars. There are other options, though, through digital, streaming, those sorts of services. Radio. And radio. Local radio. Hello. <laughs> and <laughs> WNBF.com. That, boy, that sounds self-serving. It's 1014 at WNBF. So let's talk more specifically now about your assembly race. Mm-hmm. Most listeners know you've been in the state assembly now for a while. Give us a little background for people not familiar, because a lot of times I think, well, everybody listening to Binghamton now has been around here since the beginning of time, and they know everything about everybody, but I don't want to be that presumptuous. So do, um, you know, sort of a 30 or 60 second bio sure. of how, how Donna Lopardo got her start because again for people not familiar it's not as though you've lived here for a long time Very but long you time. didn't get your start here so tell us a little bit about Donald Lepardo what compelled you to eventually wind up getting interested in sure. politics and running for the state assembly and so on I'll do my best I moved here for for graduate school I went to uh, Binghamton University in the late 70s I stayed on uh, at the university as a lecturer for 10 years until the state legislature and the governor back then made a huge cut in higher education. I never really wound up with a full-time teaching position. Then I spent the next 15 years after that working in community mental health, 
prior to my uh, election to the assembly, I was the director of education for the Mental Health Association of the Southern Tier. Uh, I decided a long time ago to uh, to make this place my home because I didn't really want to return to New York City where I grew up. And I just love this community. I love the location, the two rivers, the people, the hardworking sentiment. It was very similar to where I actually grew up, the people that I was raised by. So I felt home here. And I thought I brought a unique perspective uh, to what I saw around me. So I committed myself, um, once I got into politics, of trying to not only help people remind, you know, to help remind everybody about what a terrific story this place has of how it got started and the innovations that came out of here, but also help them build a build a new story. So I stayed by choice and I'm very, very proud of the work that, that I've done. We have a lot of challenges that remain, but I think we've accomplished a lot. What compelled you to run for office? What? That's an easy answer. I got angry. <laughs> I was very angry about this place that I had chosen to call home, this place that I thought had such enormous potential, and I saw the people who were in charge, politicians who just, I thought, had given up in this hope that some large company would come to our rescue, rescue us and create a new IBM or a new Endicott Johnson, and I knew that what we had to do was build new businesses and to reignite what I always, you know, call the entrepreneurial spirit that built this place. And that's why when we see the businesses that are coming out of the incubator, people now appreciating the food system and what can happen when people start growing and producing food and the work being done at the university that will hopefully spin out some some jobs in the battery industry. It's Things are happening. This is a fabulous place to be. And honestly, I got angry. I felt that the people in charge were selling it short. And how have you, in your opinion, been able to make a difference as a member of the New York State Assembly? Well, I've always had a good working relationship with my Senate partner, first Senator Libes, Senator Akshar, now Senator Webb. And I think together we decided where we would put our efforts. We would find things that we would agree on and go full out. Um, so getting a lot of resources for Binghamton University was super important for basically helping to develop the new thing that we might be able to manufacture again or develop a new reputation around. So the whole innovative technologies complex, with the exception of the first building, I worked together with my Senate colleagues to to get the funding for. Um, The culinary school, bringing that Carnegie Library back again to try to bring some jobs to the culinary industry. Um, restoring a lot of buildings that are now uh, nursing school, for example, for the university, uh, trying to put in some important infrastructure at our colleges and our hospitals, but also not shying away from the poverty and the troubles that we face after having ignored our economic developments for so very long. And that's one of the more disturbing aspects of Broome County right now. We have a high level of poverty. Very high especially among children. Childhood poverty remains high. And direct, whether it's directly or indirectly related, it's complicated. Um, people who are, as young people who are in, in homes without all, all the things that they really need, it makes it difficult for them to learn properly. It's I mean, it becomes almost a vicious cycle of, yes. of trying to, improve the ideals for future generations at a time when perhaps say in some pockets of the triple cities you've got kids and their parents or guardians in a a situation where they feel hopeless and maybe where they feel there's no future Uh, there's no question around it people are very very surprised to learn that the county is the second poorest in the state by percentage of population and you're absolutely right the number of children who are living in poverty is very, very high. And so it requires a concerted effort on the part of everyone. Uh, We have that going on at the same time when we have dramatic workforce shortages. We have people who are either underemployed or unemployed who we would very much like to get back into the workforce through targeted strategies. So we have to do that. Workforce development is holding us back at the moment. We have a lot of things ahead of us, but we don't have enough people to put them in the jobs, not to mention the fact 
we don't have enough housing for people to live in. And we've got, again, great opportunities. People have actually come to our community and said, we would love to relocate our business here. We need workers and we need housing. Quality of life is terrific in terms of amenities that companies look for. The rivers, the opera, the, the sports availability. All of the things you want to see, a regional farmer's market. People love that. And they think, wow, you have a lot going on here, but we need more people and we need more housing for them. Let's talk about crime. A lot of people, um, whether it's in the triple cities or across New York State, are really worried about public safety, about criminal justice issues, trying to keep our neighborhoods, our downtown districts, our retail places safe and trying to reduce criminal activity to the greatest extent possible. Also, at the same time, while trying to have a criminal justice system that's fair to everybody. So it seems Mm -hmm. it seems that New Yorkers, at least lawmakers and our governors recently over the last several years, Governor Cuomo and now Governor Hochul, are trying to strike a balance and yet I hear on an almost daily basis a lot of frustration about things that have happened in Albany. People concerned about changes that have been made by lawmakers over the last several years. They sometimes have the impression that too many people can go and steal stuff and from get away with yeah, in Walmart and mm-hmm. and basically if they're caught get an appearance ticket and they can go out and perhaps steal again, just basically misbehave and violate laws with impunity. And I'm sure you hear that. Oh, I, I certainly hear it all the time. But it's, it's difficult to try to really explain and to get your arms wrapped around what's actually going on because we have this perception that doesn't always match up with the reality on the ground of our crime statistics. I and mean, we can tell people all day long that crime numbers are going down, some categories like carjack car robberies are going up but statewide our statistics are actually going down but people don't feel it and that's the most important thing they're not feeling it and they may feel okay in their neighborhood but they certainly have a feeling that it's not safe in new york city and in other other places a lot of the criminal justice reforms were long overdue and i was someone who supported those but i was highly frustrated and continued to be The fact that we didn't send the resources along with those changes, pretrial resources, assistance for our courts, assistance for our district attorneys. They were all saying, we understand there's an unfairness here in the system, but give us the resources we need to help make this work. And that continues to be an ongoing frustration uh, for me personally and for many of my colleagues. We've made some amendments and changes, but again, without the resources to follow, it's complicated to help these folks uh, avoid recidivism and keep track of what they're doing. But yes, I couldn't agree with you more that this perception that you can, it's a revolving door process and some judges are, are allowing that to happen. Some feel they have no recourse, but honestly, it's hard to get a good conversation going when there's fear mongering on the one side and denial on the other. So we've got two extremes. There's a group of us in the middle who are saying, let's get the facts and let's help this, we'll help make this work with the resources these folks need to help make it work. Too many people are leaving New York. And as your opponent, Republican Lisa O'Keefe, points out, um, the out-migration in New York State has been a concern. It's been a concern for many years, and Mm -hmm. not just New York State in general, but here in Broome and Tioga counties in particular, and in large part, at least in our area, because of the loss of good, high-paying, reliable jobs. But there are other reasons, too. Um, property taxes, other, the high cost of doing business. What are some things that you think could make a difference to encourage more people to stay in New York or perhaps people who have left New York for places like Florida or whatever and places down south to consider coming back? Some people say, well, it's about the weather primarily, but we know it's not about the weather only that I, might be yeah. a factor. You might I wouldn't in, even right mention Jan- the weather. January or February. It might be about the weather. The other ten months of the year, New York is beautiful. So, what steps, actual steps, do you think the legislature could take to try to reverse that trend? From what I hear, most people are upset 
with the level of taxes they're paying. The property taxes are just absolutely through the roof, not just in the Binghamton area, but throughout upstate, throughout the state of New York. It is no wonder that people are going, uh, are going elsewhere. I mean, there may be some perception of quality of life issues, but honestly, a place like Binghamton is just a beautiful place to live with wonderful people. So I think people really need to confront the fact that you can't build homes around here. When people see what the property taxes look like, it's just it's it's not attractive to them. We've lost businesses, uh, people who have come and, and looked at potentially building new houses. I think that's probably the central issue uh, that we are that we're dealing with. And this is a general perception that people are not our people are out of touch with that reality. Um, people who are in charge, they're doing fine, and they're not really paying much attention to the rest of this. But I do think that. We have to rebuild our property tax base, and that means attracting new people and not being, you know, our community is welcoming. I have to tell you, we are welcoming to, to new Americans. Um, a lot of places are not, but we certainly are welcoming. And I think we have to be open to having more uh, new Americans come and other people come back. But unless we can address the property tax issue fairly, um, we're not going to really get anywhere. This area has traditionally welcomed immigrants, but yes. there are also, especially in recent years, has been growing concern about the people who are making it into the United States illegally. Mm -hmm. uh, much has been said over the last several weeks about a high-profile case where a uh, Peruvian gang leader wound up living on East Franklin Street in Endicott for several weeks. Even the cops didn't know he was there. Even Endicott police responded to at least one call for service with a disturbance. They had no idea mm -hmm. this guy with apparently quite the record in in uh, Peru was was among us. And we see that that's become certainly a high profile issue in the congressional Central. race. Central but as you know, mm -hmm. every everybody in Broome County who is concerned about this issue will hold every elected official accountable, not just members of Congress, but also state lawmakers and even, say, local mayors and, mm -hmm. and even the governor. So what can New Yorkers expect from the state legislature trying to deal with that, even if New York state law specifically had nothing to do with that guy winding up in Endicott well, earlier this year? You know, Again, this gets extremely complicated by politics, by people who are trying to promote one point of view or the other for political gain, instead of us trying to better educate everyone about who comes in legally, what their track is. These Haitian immigrants who are here legally in Springfield, for example, are getting lumped in uh, with clearly a failure at the border to come up with a policy that is welcoming of people who have a, are asylum seekers and really trying to, you know, have a fairer system that is safer for everybody. Um, so, uh, you know, my goal is to try to uh, put pressure. I think the legislature is pressuring our federal colleagues to, you know, pass that bipartisan inf immigration bill. And let's try to educate the public about who's coming in and why we need them in certain places and why we want to probably restrict other ac others from getting access. Again, it's, it's a, a, there's a lot of noise out there and very hard to just get something that's rational and safe and understandable for people. Speaking with Assemblywoman Donna Lopardo on WNBF, it's 1028 on a Wednesday morning. What's the biggest frustration when it comes to economic development around here? <laughs> we could do a whole three-hour program well, honestly, on that. It gets, back to, it gets back to a recognition of the number of people who have fallen into poverty who could be brought back into the mix if we could figure out a way to actually engage them. That is the biggest frustration for me. You know, there are strategies out there. I'm studying a curriculum right now called Bridges Out of Poverty that helps communities embrace these folks and in a way that is provides them with the dignity they need to make these decisions for themselves. But one of the ongoing concerns are, and as, as somebody who's covered so many promising economic development announcements, mm -hmm. when, when we hear of a big project and mm -hmm. you know, canopy growth in Kirkwood, mm -hmm. it was supposed sure. to be hundreds and hundreds of jobs. State and federal officials were enthusiastic mm -hmm. that... Hemp would take off there initially and then ultimately probably uh, can cannabis as it was legalized in New York State. That didn't turn out to work. I mean, you look back over the last 
oh, 20, 30, 40 years in Broome County, we've heard so many promises and hopes and dreams of employers that might bring hundreds, if not more than just several hundred jobs, and they don't come to fruition. We're still holding our breath about the development of the battery battery facility (laughs) in Endicott and also with the research facility for Binghamton University in Johnson City. And people, on the one hand, are excited. And on the other hand, I think they feel like Charlie Brown did with you know, Lucy and the football, it's like we've we've been down this road before yes. where we had great expectations only to have our hopes dashed. So with mm-hmm. with that track record, how can how can New York lawmakers and local officials really work to have economic development promises come true? After learning a couple of tough lessons over the years, uh, I am rarely one of those people who is touting a big promise. I think that's another aspect of politics that is frustrating to me uh, is that, you know, people make the promise and get the ribbon cut or do the groundbreaking and then walk away and fail to see how how it has to work, the things you need to do to actually make it succeed. Um, the Micron uh, project in Syracuse, for example, you know, that, that's that, that's not a, a given in terms of the hoops that they're going to have to jump through just to site that facility, never mind finding the tens of thousands of people involved in having to work on it. So I have practiced uh, a much more conservative approach to making big promises anymore. I just try to work every day, chip away at the things that we need to do and try to build coalitions with people from all parties uh, to try to make it work. I mean, one of the things... and. I look back at some of the the excitement that was generating with what was thought to be an emerging hemp industry, mm-hmm. and yeah, everybody else had the same idea. Yeah, across the country, and everybody else across the world started shipping in contaminated goods and ruined what would have been a very good thing for our farmers to be growing for industrial purposes. We're going to get back to that in a much more sober and conscious way. <laughs> so looking ahead the next two years, if you are reelected to mm-hmm. the assembly, what will be your primary goals? Do you have any specific things that you would like to accomplish in the next term as far as specific legislation that you haven't introduced yet or uh, emerging issues that perhaps we haven't touched on this morning? Well, I'm really a broken record locally on trying to uh, address workforce challenges, poverty, and housing. Uh, statewide, I am a one of the organizing voices to help with our stabilize our nursing homes, which are closing all across the state because the reimbursement levels have been so low. I'm also organizing on the Rescue EMS Advocacy Plan to help with our ambulance services. Uh, we've passed two major le- pieces of legislation for them in the last two years. Um, But uh, unless we name them an essential service, as essential as police, fire, and other services like that, we're not going to get anywhere. So I'm focused on the basics right now, keeping our nursing homes, keeping our schools uh, safe and well-funded, making sure our ambulances are still in service, (laughs) the real bread and butter stuff. But as the chair of the Committee on Agriculture and Food, uh, I also represent in Albany all of the eaters of my district and across the state who want good, fresh, healthy, and local Foods grown on farms run by families. We want to keep families on the land, and we want to be able to honor the work they do. So I've got my hands full with what I call the basics, the basic stuff. Working, housing, (laughs) ambulance service, care for our elderly. That's my focus. It's been my focus, and it's going to continue to be. A couple of matters that aren't really election issues, but still in the news recently, of course, Several days ago, the dedication of the Rod Serling statue at Recreation Park on the west side. There was a project that people had been hoping for for a long time, and some people doubted it would ever happen. But ultimately, with uh, private contributions as well as some state support, it happened. Yeah, I'm very, very pleased with the way that turned out. I was able to get them a pretty good size grant to help push that over the finish line but then i wound up being the person on the ground most of the serling foundation folks were scattered around the country i was the project manager to make sure every detail was established in in time for serling fest for the great reveal of the statue and 
people were so so happy with that and i'm i just hope it stays safe we've got a camera on it and people will want to see the twilight zone creator whose home was right down the street from rec park and people have been excited locally and around the country and around the world. People have seen the, the pictures and the videos since the statue was unveiled. You're a social media legend, I hear. Some people say. One of the other matters uh, of concern to people in the Triple Cities, and specifically Endicott, and we've talked about it frequently, sometimes off air, sometimes on air, the IBM Endicott collection, and sadly, it's no longer in Endicott. And we covered that aspect of the story, and it was a sad day early this year when the moving vans came. And But one thing that was impressive is IBM officials were there on site to, to supervise as that historic and, I say, priceless collection was being carefully packaged and then taken from Endicott for storage in Poughkeepsie. And storage. I, right. And you have said that you still are hopeful that it can one day return to our area, preferably to Endicott. Absolutely. I would have been inconsolable if it left without the understanding that it was temporary and that we would get it back. I have state capital resources available to help with uh, placing it again, but to your earlier point about making promises, (laughs) you know, my promise is to stay on the case. But I also promise to make sure it goes someplace where it will stay and be protected and valued for generations to come. So, yes, we want it back in the area. We want to make sure it stays. And this is part of what I started out talking about is that we want to protect the story, the story of this community. We have so much to be proud of. And losing a collection like this hurts. So, yes, I have every intention to get it back once we know it's going to stay. Do IBM representatives understand the importance, the significance of the IBM collection to the Triple Cities? Yes, they do, which is why they lovingly packed it up and have assured me that it will be cared for and stored properly until we can get it back. (laughs) There's been some speculation that if something isn't determined relatively soon, that perhaps IBM might run out of patience and maybe just move parts of the collection to various IBM sites around the country or around the world. Have you heard anything I to that effect? None of, I have heard nothing of that of the sort. And if that were the case, I would be the first one to drive down there <laughs> and make it very clear what our intentions are about this collection. Donna Lopardo, Assemblywoman, Democrat, representing the 123rd District. You're facing a challenge from Republican Lisa O'Keefe. So we wrap up the segment looking ahead to the election 41 days away. So what do you do? As as we said right at the outset, the the media and the chattering classes seem to be laser-focused on the presidential race. How do you generate enough enthusiasm or excitement as you continue continue your campaign? Early voting will start soon, and then the election will be November 5th. How do you generate the... um, support from people across this district to actually say, oh, the assembly race is important, too. Well, I mean, there are the basics of campaigning, you lawn signs and your advertising where we can put ads on TV and all of the rest of the digital ads and streaming. But my approach has always been to just work. I'm working. I'm working at my job. I'm showing up at things. We're making news where news is worthy. And that's how I've always approached this. I have a 20-year history of 100% commitment to this community. And I think people know it. Whether they agree with all of the policies that I have promoted or not, they know that I work hard. And that's how I approach what I'm doing. Assemblywoman Donna Lopardo, thanks for being with us on this Wednesday morning. Bob Joseph, you're very welcome. It's 1039. We're live and local on WNBF and WNBF.com. Vic from the Forks, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, Bob. I was just listening to your um, uh, interview with Harris, or not Harris, um, Lopardo, and um, my stomach is turning. I I can't believe she said the things she said. She said she champions change in the community and, and that she works on the basics, such as nursing homes. 
Well, the nurses in Broome County have not got a budget increase from the state since 2007. And, uh, and that's under her watch. That's under her watch. Farms have been closing left and right, and solar farms have been taking over farm property under her watch. Uh, uh, farmers are not allowed to have more than 99 cows under her watch unless they get a special permit from the state because she's worried about nitrates flowing into the river. You know, I've dealt with Donna personally, and and, and I've been to a few of her meetings, and I've been to meetings where she didn't expect me and caught her in lies. Donna Lepardo, I'm sorry, Bob, but but she should not be even running. She should be resigning in shame. So she you're, uh, I take it then. Before. So the upshot is you're you're not really a fan. No, no, that's the upshot. The, but the upshot here, Bob, I'm not a fan. Be, I am not not a fan because she's a Democrat. I am not a fan because the way she rolls over people and flip flops on issues and then points the finger in other directions. Okay, well, what issue? People. What issue specifically did she flip flop on? Well, I'll go back to the one they printed in the newspaper where I called her out in a lie and it got printed in the paper. She he flip flop on gas drilling. One day she went with the landowners at the Methodist Church in Endicott, told them she was on. She was, uh, 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 more the first day meeting in the library. Yeah, your 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 phone is dropping out. Try to get close to a window. We're we're losing about half of what you're saying. I can you hear me now? Yes. So we missed about half of what you're saying. So you don't like her position on, on fracking. What else? Well, no, it's not that I didn't like her position on fracking. Well, I you said like she changed she... her position. You said at one point she was supporting landowners, and then you say she changed. What else? No, I didn't say she was supporting landowners. I said she met with landowners at the Methodist Church in Endicott. Okay, and and so how did, how did she flip-flop on that? Well... That day that we met with her, the Joint Landowners Coalition of New York met with her in uh, the Methodist Church in Endicott. And she told us that she was on the fence and waiting for uh, the, the information to come in, the studies and all this stuff. And the next day at the Vesta Library, she told NIRAD, and I was at that meeting because I just crashed it. And she didn't know I was at the meeting the day before. She told the NIRAD people that she's doing everything she can to block the uh, gas drilling, that, that they're putting up a good fight and keep up the work. That's flip-flopping, Bob. When you tell half of your constituents that you're working on their behalf, just waiting for more information, and then tell the other half that, yeah, I'm voting against it, I, I'm dead set against fracking, you're putting on a good fight, that's flip-flopping. That's lying to half the people in Broome County and to all the farmers. Many of those farmers I know personally are now out of business because of taxation. Uh, uh, you know, they they still get, only get 25 cents per hundred at the uh, uh, creameries for their milk. Uh, they, they're not the ones making money off this $25 steak in the supermarkets. Uh, it's not the farmers making that money. It's the grocery stores. Well, so what, what uh, more can New York State do to help farmers? I, I understand farmers yeah. are struggling. They've been struggling for decades. So what more could New York State do to help them so they can they can have a business that's sustainable, a business that they can pass on to future generations. What can New York State do? New York State and Donald Lepardo could have passed fracking. If you go down to Pennsylvania... Well, I'm saying at this point, I mean, at at the moment, at the moment, Vic, fracking is, is not in not likely to be changed. I'm not saying it'll never change in New York, personally, because of the amount of money involved. I, I'm expecting the Marcellus Shale uh, gas extraction to happen at some point somehow because of all the money involved. I just don't know exactly how or when it'll happen, but because of money, you know, money talks and no one walks. But so aside from fracking, because that's not happening in the short term, what type of legislation could whoever represents the southern tier in the assembly support next year to better assist our, the farmers that remain? 
I think they should legislate the way New Jersey did. Welfare, 90 days and off. That, you know, I, we've had that conversation. But how does that help farmers? Well, I'm, I'm talking about taxes. Well, I was talking. Okay. All right. Taxes. Well, I, I agree. I need lower taxes. You do too. And I don't think anybody listening is going to disagree with us when, when Vic and Bob say New York State ought to do more to lower taxes. So we do have, we do have one area of agreement. I guess the biggest thing is how to do it. When a tree falls over a creek, knocking down a fence that keeps the cattle in or the, the, the beef or the milkers in their pen, and if the D.C. comes out and finds them for cutting that tree up and repairing their fence, that can be changed. Uh, there's too many regulations in the farm industry, and, and they're to protect the watershed for the Susquehanna River from nitrates flowing from the farmlands into the uh, uh uh, water uh, and you know I think to protect our water, but farm has been an industry in New York State that has been dying since the 1960s. I, I grew up on a farm, Bob, and I remember them coming in and saying, "Hey, you got to whitewash the interior of your, of your stalls because cows actually you know poop on their tail and they wag their tails and they fling cow dung on the wall and." and you know that that makes sense because you're milking cows. You don't want dung to get in the milk, but even though they didn't, because you had air pumpers, but uh, uh, it made sense. But what they did was they made when when they came into our farm and they looked at the uh, uh, condition of the barn, they thought they had something to do with the uh, milking or with the quality of the milk, and it had nothing to do with the milk. It's what it is is they regulated farmers out of business they put so many regulations and taxes on they're done and we lost more farms under lopardo's watch in history since in the history of any legislator we've had well my guess is many if not most of those regulations you referenced were already in effect before she became a member of the assembly well, there's a brewery up in Cooperstown that dumps 80,000 uh, gallons of waste into the nitrates, nitrate waste, into the mouth of the Susquehanna. Well, how do they get away with it? Do they have a waiver? Yeah, they're grandfathered. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I know it's complicated, and I, I understand whether it's in the agriculture business or any other business in New York, overregulation continues to be... A big problem, and it, it certainly is a challenge, especially for the smaller businesses, whether you're talking about farmers or people just trying to operate a mom-and-pop retail business or a restaurant. The regulations are, are oppressive. One quick thing, Bob, because I know my time's running out. She talked about immigrants and that we need them to come into this country, and, you know, that's true. And these are people, and as a Christian, we should reach out and help the people that come here illegally. The ones that come here illegally, we should help return them, not embrace them, not put them in the system, not give them uh, Social Security or welfare checks or housing allotments. And and you often mention about how that guy got from Endicott, well, Endicott that was a that gang leader that killed 24 people or whatever it was. You often mention that. And, and you refer to Texas and Texas shipping them out. But I don't think you ever once mentioned that uh, that Biden had airplanes dropping people off. So at, you're, at you're suggesting Biden had something to do with the guy from Texas getting to East Franklin Street in Endicott? Is that what you're implying? Yes. Okay. Well, when you find out evidence, so whether it's Biden and his his policies or the policies of Texas or the policies of New York State. When you find out how that guy wound up on East Franklin Street in Endicott, I want you to send me an email. All right, Vic? Thank you. I, I mean, speculation. Anybody can speculate. And a lot of people say they have ideas. I haven't seen anyone yet who has the information. There has to be a way of finding out how he got in well, obviously, he, one way or the other, slipped in illegally to the United States, then was apprehended and given paperwork, apparently, for a future hearing. So what happened after that? From that point on, 
How did he wind up getting from Texas to East Franklin Street in Endicott? I want to know. Someone call and explain how it happened. I'm Bob Joseph. You're listening to Binghamton Now on WNBF. There's a group of... It's 11.56. Let's go back to the phones. Good morning, WNBF. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hi, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Uh, Ernest Conklin. Morning. What's on your mind, Ernest? Uh, hi. Uh, just uh, uh, recalling a phone call from yesterday. Uh, the one fellow was adamant about, you know, vote Democrats, vote Democrats, vote Democrats, fine. But the uh, let, let's remember they've had the White House 12 out of the last 16 years, so... Uh, let's not get greedy. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, also would like to, uh, say that, uh, I'm here for the music, Bob. Uh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. You haven't yeah, called in a while, though. Yeah, I, I, I Try know, calling I more often. I, I, you know, I, I'd like to, but then again, you, you have to have a reason to call. Oh, true. All right. <laughs> anyway, thanks for checking in. Tell tell everyone in the town of Conklin I said hi. Yeah, those speed bumps on uh, on Conklin Road now they've milled them down. They have these good seams would rise on All the right. road. So Progress. It's a little easier on, <laughs> on the eyeballs. Yeah. Hey, have thank a good you. One. Thanks. It's ten fifty seven. WNBF serving the community. Ninety two point one FM. Twelve ninety AM. Online at wnbf dot com. It is September 25th. Soon it'll be October. I heard a very serious news story this morning. And I think it's, I think it's something we need to talk about. <laughs> and if, if you're sensitive, you might not want to talk about it. But anyway, we will talk about it. Hmm. It's the debate. The debate is happening soon, just days from now. The big, big debate. J.D. Vance and Tim Walls. So, a number of questions come to mind. Will you listen to it? Will you watch it? Will you try to ignore it? What do you intend to do about the debate? Because it is happening. We can't stop it. Nobody can stop it. They Both sides have agreed. So, it's going to happen next Tuesday, whether you like it or not. So, J.D. Vance and Tim Walls will debate. They say it will be the most important vice presidential debate ever. Ever. Not just the most important, but also the best. So, obviously, everyone has to make his or her own choice about whether you or your family should partake in this debate. I know I will partake in it. Who knows, maybe I'll get together another focus group. We had a focus group that popped up for the presidential debate earlier this month. That was not planned, but maybe maybe I'll plan set up a focus group. We'll have a focus group at the arena for the vice presidential debate. I think it should be good. Will be good. Uh, according to thehill.com, Vance and Walls will meet in New York City for their first and only scheduled debate in the clash that will air on CBS. All right. Well, it says the last vice presidential debate featured Kamala Harris and Mike Pence. According to this story, posted on thehill.com, it was a night when Harris notably pushed back on Pence repeatedly interrupting her. Oh, and a fly landed on Mike Pence's head. I had forgotten that. 
Well, I hope they have a fly swatter handy next Tuesday for the most important vice presidential debate ever. <laughs> uh, I just thought of something. But don't worry, I'll I'll save it probably till Friday. It is somewhat funny, by the way. 607-772-1290 is the Binghamton Now number. What is on your mind on this Wednesday? Let's take a random call. Hi, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Bob, good morning. This is Vinny from Binghamton. Wow. I, um, yeah, well, you know, I, I was listening today, and I heard a caller, maybe two calls, maybe the last caller, talked about uh, the Democrats have had it for, uh, was it uh, eight out of the last 12 years? You know, let's not get greedy. Um you know, once again, we're not we're not voting for the junior class president. And this is an OK, my turn, your turn. That's not, it's not what it is. We need to vote for president of the United States to get something done. That's what we need. we got to get things done. There's so many things that we have that are going on in this country and are going on in the world. And we need a leadership. We don't have to sit there and prove that we're the most powerful nation in the world with our bombs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Bob, it's about someone who's going to have diplomacy. We don't have to prove our strength to anybody. And if 9-11 didn't show you anything, it showed you that the terrorists in this world are not afraid of the United States of America. Also showed the terrorists will never win. Exactly. Exactly. So it's diplomacy. That's the one thing. Um, the, the second thing I wanted to call about is um, I, I, I got got to reach out and and because I I heard Vic talk about this border nonsense again. And um, if Bob, if I could reach out to a caller because I like to consider him the people that call and I I consider him the elder statesman, Joe from Owego. Man, he calls in, he likes to read, has questions, very nice. Joe, get online and pull up the National Immigration Form. It's the Board of Security and Asylum Reform. This was in the Emergency National Security Supplemental Appropriations Act, 2004. You've got to pull that up, Joe. And I want you to read, and just read it, the Appropriations Act, 2002 for the bill explainer. And I want you to look up what J Senator James Langford from Oklahoma, Kristen Sinema from Arizona, and Chris Murphy from, Dem uh, from Connecticut. That was our border bill. That is like one of the best they have seen in decades. That was a bipartisan bill. If I can use a basketball explanation, it was a full court press. That's how you handle the borders. Now, you've got that, and, uh, and you've got to read it. Read it. And that shows you why Donald Trump called all those congressmen and women and said, don't vote on it. That is why Mark Johnson or Mike Johnson, that's why he didn't even bring it to the floor, because it's a powerful, powerful borders bill and is the way you have to solve it. That is what Josh Riley is talking about. Some of those things that he said are in this bill. This nonsense about uh, taking all the people, all these immigrants, grounding them up, Bob, and sending them back. In five to ten years, those people will be right back here in this country. You know why? Because that's not a border bill. we got to go down to the border and solve. That's where the problem is. But once again, what's going on in this country? We don't have the Sam Donaldsons and the Dan Rathers to question this. We got these guys, they're all looking up in the ceiling. These these guys don't know how to how to ask these questions. Mm, that's true. I mean, the golden age of journalism is over. But you've got to you've got to read it. It's got so much stuff in there about creating an emergency expulsion authority to prevent the entrance of immigrants, asylum seekers when they are extraordinary in uh, migration circumstances. The laws, because if not. It's just a turning. It's just a, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a turning door. They go in. They come back out. They go back out. They come in. And that's what would happen with this deportation that, that um, Trump is talking about. They'll be back here with five, ten years. They'll be right back here. But you guys said, "Oh, that's what he should do," not realizing that's not a border. That's a sleight of hand. That's that's a carnival barker nonsense. That's not how you handle this thing, because it's been going on, Bob, for so long. Things are jammed up. 
it's like, oh, my God. So these people are slipping in. Now, yeah, well, I know. It's a real mess. And if people want to go and check out the website, again, mention the website so people can find it if they want to get the additional information you were referencing. Yeah, what I have is called the Border Security and Asylum Reform. It's in the National Emergency National Security Supplemental Appropriations Act, 2024. And it's online. So are, yeah. Bill okay. Explain. I pulled I'm looking at it right now. You should see all the stuff that is in that bill. And and, and I will tell. I, Bob, you can be able to tell when people didn't read it when they call in. Because you, did you guys read the bill? Did you read the bill? Did you see what Donald Trump called in? Because you knew he read the bill. And he saw what was in it, and he told his congressman, don't vote on it. All right. Well, we'll see what uh, other listeners think. Thank you. 1119 WNBF. Let's see another call turning up on our hotline. Good morning. You're on the air. Hi, this is Jim from Port Dickinson. Hey, Jim. What's up? Uh, listen to Vinny. He uh, continually blames the Republicans for not op- or closing the border. I believe the President Biden opened the border with a flick of a pen. Why can't he close it with a flick of a pen? Okay, good question. We'll put that out there, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. 1120 WNBF, good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hello, my name is Steve. I'm from Binghamton. Hey, Steve. I'm calling. Hi. I'm just calling to say that I'm getting a little tired of these Trump derangement people keep calling. And I, all, the, all the president has to do, the president, whoever he is, president, if he's Joe Biden, if he's Kamala, I don't even know who's president, who's running this country. All they have to do is sign a bill, executive order, to shut the border. That's all they had to do. I'm so sick and tired of these Trump derangement people. It really irritates me. They think they know what they're talking about. They don't. Period. All right, so what should they do in the meantime? Uh, meantime, we got to elect a new president. Well, so we will. I mean, out. the one thing we know, and I, I agree with you, this is where you and I are in, in agreement, complete agreement. We must elect a new president, and the reason is Joe Biden is out. January 20th at noon, he's out, so we need a new president now more than ever. Yeah, but that me, I'm who, who is running the country? Darned if I, mean, I know. He, how yeah, exactly. how would I know? I mean, look, I, they, I, I mean, it's not as though he ever calls in and does interviews with people like me. I have a few questions for President Joe Biden. I want to know exactly what he's doing. I, I mean, I see these occasional appearances. He spoke at the U.N. General Assembly on Tuesday morning. But he never answers questions. He should be holding a news conference every Sunday night at 7. Yeah, you know what? If you can believe him, I half the time I don't believe the guy anyway. I just, I just well, can't believe. I don't trust what he says. Well, it's not a matter of trust, but it, it does come down to: is he doing the best he can? Huh? Is he capable of doing the best he can? Too? Well, he's that's, capable that's, of doing the best he can. The question is: is is that good enough? Apparently I'm, not. Well, I mean, again, Are you know he. You know, I mean, look, he, you know, hey, he's he's a person like like each of us. We we can't control our situation. We can only do on any given day the best we can. It's not, you know, we're not blaming anyone. We're not blaming him. He's doing the best he can well, under the circumstances. Well, you know, I mean, he, he, he's responsible. He said he's going to bring America together. He never did. And he's always separating people about the MAGA people being the pro-right and their white racist and all this. He never brought America together like he said he was going to. I never trusted this guy. Never liked him. I gave him a chance as a president. I give him the uh, consideration. He's the president. I'll have a little respect. None was there. None whatsoever. And I believe Kamala Harris is going to pull the same thing. Wow. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see starting January 20th. I appreciate your call. It's 1124 at WNBF. We live in interesting times. These are the times that are the best. 
the most excitement, the most the most challenges. This is America. We're up for the challenge. You're at News Radio WNBF. More calls coming up. 607-772-1290. I'm Bob Joseph. This is Binghamton Now. All right, let's take another call on this Wednesday morning. Hi, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Uh, Martin from Binghamton. Hey, Martin, what's up? Good morning. Hey, uh, you know, you were talking yesterday about Trump grabbing the flag and how patriotic he is. Well, you know, I uh, did a little fact-checking. So I remembered this, uh, that he wanted to suspend the Constitution. This is an article by Tom Norton. And it threw Newsweek, he writes for Newsweek, and a fact check on him. And uh, in December of 22, uh, Trump called for the termination of all rules, even those found in the Constitution, in regard to the voter fraud uh, that was uh, uh, supposedly found. And it was refuted by so many sources. And then he goes on to say, he wrote that on, that was on True, True Social. Then he, a couple of days later, he wrote that on, uh, they're trying, they're trying to say that I called to suspend the Constitution, which he did. I mean, it, he tells so many lies. He can't keep track. You know, this well, is Well, it's tough. Stuff. It's tough. I mean, and one thing is he, he talks a lot. He's, I bet in typical day, I would bet he talks more than I do, and you know how much I talk. Yeah, but he meant that. I mean, that's just, that was a thing at that time. Right. Well of, course, oh, well, of course he meant it. Meant it. Of course he did. Yeah, well. You know, well, it's, and it's, that's, it's, that's what's good about it, because at least with him, he's talking. At least with him, you know what you're going to get. What about Kamala Harris? How come she doesn't talk? Well, you know, th- 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 let's not go there. Let's go about what he said. You're talking about him wrapping around the flag. Right. And this, and this well, flag, you, and, and you haven't seen, look, you haven't seen Kamala Harris hug the flag. When is the last time Kamala Harris hugged the American flag? I'd say never. That's just a photo shoot, Bob. That doesn't well, matter. Well, she could do it. She could, if if he did it, she can do it. It's It's, it's symbolic. Trivial. It's symbolic. It's Americans Americans want to see their candidates show their love for the flag. That's trivial. Do we know that? That was just that's just Trump being Trump. That's nothing. Then he calls to suspend the Constitution. Even you're talking about that. When this guy's talking to suspend all the rules and regulations, and, and uh, this and the exact quote was a little bit longer, but it, it's like. Uh, our founders would never put up with this uh, BS with the uh, voter fraud elections and going on and on. And, you know, it was refuted by how many people? Over 60-some judges throughout the whole country. And this guy still pushed. And he's still pushing it now. I mean, come on. You know. I mean, well, I didn't say I support it, but I support his right to say it. Well, let him say it. Right. BS. No, that, but that's what's good about it, because that way people know what he has in mind. That's why Kamala Harris ought to be telling more about what she has in mind. What? Why? Why the silence? Why? Why isn't she doing interviews? I want to see more interviews on the issues. She talked about plans. What she has, but she doesn't you know, talk well, about her plans as much as Donald Trump. He at least talks about his plans. You don't have to like him, but at least you know what his plans are. Yeah, to suspend the Constitution? Well, I didn't say he should suspend the Constitution. Then then Kamala Harris ought to do an interview and say, I don't plan to suspend the Constitution. For every time that Trump does an interview, she ought to do one longer. I mean, that's what it's about. If you want the job, do an interview. Well, I guess she'll she'll be talking about things. Well, when? You know. Time's running out. 41 days till la- uh, left till the election. Come on, time's a wasting. Well, I don't know exactly what Trump has said, but uh, all I know is, you know, if you look at 2024 and you look at the uh, debate, one of the last things, where is his uh, health care bill? Where is that? 
These Democrats have had eight years. He had nothing. He said he had concepts. Concepts, Bob. Well, That's, again, yeah, at least he's talking. You don't have to like what he says, but many people do. So Kamala Harris could say more. Instead of doing these appearances with Oprah, what was that about? Why why appear with, with Oprah when you could be interviewed by somebody like Steve Croft or someone? Or Sean Hannity. Why doesn't she get interviewed by Hannity or Tucker Carlson? Come on, man. The topic was Medicare and health care. Well, I'm saying, okay, it's fine. So she she had the event with Oprah. Okay, fine. Then this week she ought to do a similar event with Tucker Carlson. Oh, God. Why? You know, you know matter of fact, that's what D- Donald Trump did after he said that. He went on Tucker Carlson and, uh, um, you know, was, was still pushing that BS about the voter fraud. And he still is. Yeah, but then Kamala Harris could be on the same program with Tucker Carlson, and she could offer some pushback. That's true. Yeah. You know, uh, see, well, see, I don't understand this, this whole political philosophy, especially with the presidential candidates, that they only want to face questions from their friends and their supporters. I mean, nothing wrong with that. I get why you want to do that. Of course, if I was running... I would try to line up interviews only with my friends. But then I would say, wait a second. I am running for the presidency of the United States of America. So I should do interviews not only with my friends, but I should do interviews with people who are sworn enemies to show that I'm up to the task. Do not be afraid. If you believe, and this applies to any candidate, actually for any office, if you believe in your position on the issues, don't be afraid of an interviewer. All they can do is ask questions. And I think you show more courage by being interviewed by someone who everyone knows doesn't support you. And that's why that's why I think, see, if I were running her campaign, or for that matter, if I was running his campaign, I would suggest to the candidate, yes, do the interviews with the people who our friends and supporters do those interviews, but also publicly request interviews by people who are opposed to you. So Donald Trump should publicly say today, I want to be interviewed live by Rachel Maddow on MSNBC tonight. And at the same time, Kamala Harris should say, I want to be interviewed by Sean Hannity on Fox tonight. They ought to be saying that. Yeah, and let's fact check him. Let's fact, fact check, check him. Do not it. just fact check him, fact check her too. Both. They're Both, right. always. Yeah. Well, and they, and they, don't they, force, they, by they, the way, don't force the person who's doing the interview to do live fact checking. You need people who are off camera and have access to the internet so they can actually work to pr- provide facts because, trust me, in a live interview, live interviews are tough. On radio, they're tough. On TV, they're a lot tougher. So to expect, say in the debate, people were were upset because of the way the fact-checking was done by the ABC moderators. Well, when you're on camera on TV, fact-checking is nearly impossible. It's it, it well, just, I'm not check. saying you can't do it, but it's, it's fraught with danger because any time that you try to correct... A candidate or try to get a clarification, you run the risk that you will inadvertently or maybe intentionally, you run the risk that you might say something that's factually incorrect. And then the whole focus turns away from the candidates and turns over to a moderator who misstated something, maybe unintentionally or maybe intentionally. But that's the problem with live fact checking during a debate or an interview. You can't expect the person who's asking the questions also do the fact-checking. It's unrealistic. Well, after the debate, they did fact-checking, and it was like 8 to yeah, 1. Yeah, I know. We've heard it all. It I, was, I know. Okay, I, well, I read the papers. Bob. But my point still, 
again, my basic point is for each of these candidates, both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, that they stop playing it safe and start acting like they really want the job. And the, the way that Kamala Harris and Donald Trump can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they really want this job is to set up a series of interviews with people who are harshly critical of them all the time. Face these people. Face your critics head on because, after all, this is the most important job. So do it. If if you can face – if Donald Trump can face an hour with Rachel Maddow, if Kamala Harris can face an hour with Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity, good. Of course they can. These people didn't just get off the – candidate boat they've been candidates before they know what it's like to be in a live setting so they should be able to handle i mean kamala harris should be able to handle any question hannity or tucker carlson or anybody else throws her way and trump should be able to handle any question from rachel maddow or anybody from msnbc or cnn or any other it's not that hard to do just oh well Look, a candidate. Look, a candidate. What is it if he talks and all he spews is BS? Hey, a candidate in this country is allowed to spew whatever they want. The voters are not stupid. The voters can tell. I'm not saying everybody knows everything, but a candidate is not going to be able to fool all the people all the time. Do more interviews. And start doing interviews with people you know don't like you. Even do interviews with people you don't like. So maybe Kamala Harris doesn't like Sean Hannity. So maybe she doesn't like Mark Levin or Dan Bongino. She ought to be on their programs over the next two weeks. You don't have to like the interviewer to show that you're ready for the job. Can you imagine Kamala Harris live for three hours with Dan Bongino? I can. Or three hours with Sean Hannity or three hours with Mark Levin or five hours with the Red Eye Radio guys. Do it. Do you want a job? If you really, the most important job, if you want the job, demonstrate it. Demonstrate that you are able and willing to face the toughest questions from your toughest critics. That's what I think the American people would find impressive. This is Bob Joseph. Just a couple of thoughts on Binghamton Now. More calls more often. Let's see who the phone wizards have brought us. Good morning. You're on the line. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Good morning, Bob. Jesse from Owego. When you were, uh, you and Vinny were bringing up the border bill, I think honestly that that bill, all in itself, if there was nothing else attached to it, I think would have been uh, overwhelmingly passed. And I think I remember you, gosh, I'm going to go back when the bill was first introduced. And I remember you saying, Okay, if you people are very serious, pass the bill. And if anything, call the bluff if the Biden administration is serious. But they added all kinds of pork beyond that bill. And that's what they were voting down, not the bill itself. So if they're very serious, reintroduce the bill, but don't add anything else to it. Well, yeah, but that's not how it's done in Washington. They don't do well, it that way. The, well, that's where the porculous stuff comes from. Right, and, it's like, and that's uh, that's the whole point. In in Washington, that's how they do it. Well, I would say reintroduce the bill as it is, add nothing to it, and let's see if it flies. Well, you could try it, but they, they won't. Well, I See, you and I and don't that. run the, the stuff down there. They run it their way, and they do it for their reasons. Yep, but that's the only reason why it failed. Well, it's not the only reason, 
There was another big reason, too, and his name is Donald Trump. But, no, Donald Trump didn't want them to approve it. So, of course, Republicans weren't going to approve something against the will of their presidential candidate. I'd have to look into that more, but was he saying don't vote for the border bill itself? Or was it because of all the other stuff that was added into it? Because I don't, I don't recall. recall. I don't recall specifically. Seems like he was just saying don't vote for it at all. I I don't recall. I don't recall all the specifics. It just seemed to me he didn't want he didn't want it approved because he didn't want it approved. I mean, the the reality is, like it or not, this is the issue. They the Republicans love this issue, and Jesse, what would have happened? Seriously, what would happen with the presidential campaign if this had been cleared up and was not a campaign issue? What would the Republicans' issue be? Well, that, I don't know. I mean, the economy, of course, the economy, because the economy still troubles a lot of people. You know, the high prices of food, that would be a good topic. But now that inflation seems to be somewhat under control it's obviously a lot better than it had been and now that it seems pretty clear we're not going to have a recession before november 5th you know the economy could be a good issue if you framed it the wrong way but you know the immigration is i think it's what republicans widely regard as the winning issue that's what their research shows and that's why i think that donald trump didn't want congress to get a good immigration bill done before the election. I'm just hoping when these uh, two vice presidents get together and hold a debate, I don't want no dirty dancing. I want to hear issues, period. Yes. What are you going to do? Issues. I want issues and answers. But that's the one I'm not hearing. And like, you know, like we talked about last week, you got to put your feet into the fire and go into enemy territory because if you're running for the most powerful position on the planet, tell me what you're going to do. It's not that hard. Oh, and by the way, what's wrong with my idea with Kamala Harris being interviewed by Tucker Carlson? Or what's wrong with my idea I, with Donald Trump being interviewed by Rachel Maddow? How come people aren't embracing that idea? It seems simple enough. You would think that the lines would be flooded with people saying, Bob, that's the best idea I've heard all year. That's because they're taking the path of least resistance. Oh, come on, man. Wow, well, they, they yeah. can't. Oh, they can't be. They can't be that afraid. What's to be afraid of? You're she telling you're telling me that Donald Trump is afraid of Rachel Maddow. You're telling me Kamala Harris is afraid of Tucker Carlson. I think they're all becoming pussified. No. No. They have to have courage. You want the job? Sh show me. Right, Jesse? Show me, Bob and Jesse. Sounds like a cartoon show on Saturday. Bob yeah, and did. Jesse. So show Bob and Jesse and everybody else in America how much you want the job. Thank you, Jesse. That's the story from a week ago right now on WNBF. Hi, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Oh, let's try this line. Hi, what's your name and where are you calling from? Bob, I apologize before I begin. Oh, well, okay, apology accepted. Again, while there is no official rule, unofficially, one per day. Please, please, I implore you. Hi, WNBF, you're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hey, good morning there, Bob. Uh, Dave from Vestal. Yeah, what say you? <laughs> I've, been getting, I've been getting a kick out of everything that's been going on here and everything I've been listening to. But first of all, I, when you said uh, Harris sitting down for three hours with, with Hannity, Bob, she couldn't hold up three hours against any. Uh, I don't believe that for a minute. That is a load. That is a load of propaganda, and you know it. Kamala Harris... A well-known prosecutor from the state of California could easily handle three hours with Hannity, easily three hours with Bongino, 
uh, maybe only two hours with Levin because he's the constitutional expert. She could do it. She just doesn't want to. We'd get a lot of uh, passage of time, children of the community type things, Bob. That's all you would get. It, it, she's an empty shell. But real quick, I would, I, Bob, I'm getting so tired of hearing about this border stuff, especially with Vinny. He keeps calling in saying, oh, don't criticize Vinny. Don't criticize callers anymore. You know, enough of that. Don't criticize. You can talk about your topic. If you are tired of immigration, then talk about the high price of gas. There's no need to criticize the topics that certain callers choose. We love the topics. I, I love I love talking about the high price of gas. But I also don't mind if people talk about immigration. Go ahead. Talk about whatever topic motivates you. What? I always call after that topic. When someone... Well, again, you know, see, that's what happens frequently with this program is people, it, they, they're trying to in, turn it into Saturday Night Live with Jane, you ignorant person. You know, point, counterpoint. I mean, in the end, point, counterpoint got boring on Saturday Night Live and on 60 Minutes because it was so predictable. So one person says something about some topic, and they talk for a few seconds or a couple of minutes, and then somebody comes on and says the opposite. And it's like, okay, so we've balanced it out. We heard the pros and cons, and nothing gets accomplished. So you know, when people, and, and I'm not saying you can't do it, keep doing it because people love to, to respond to other callers, but you don't have to say, I am tired of someone saying, uh, about a particular topic, just say what what you think about the topic. Say immigration, schmimmigration. Let's talk about the high price of gas. Are you going to let me, or are you just going to think about it? Five thousand a day, Bob. Five thousand a day. So huh? what you know? So you're talking about immigration. So good. So again. Talk about whatever you want to talk about, but I'm saying in the future, you don't have to say every time so-and-so calls, I get tired of it. I get tired of people criticizing individual callers. Just move straight ahead and say about immigration, I'm tired of 5,000 people a day coming in illegally. Say that. You don't have to take a, a shot at one of our callers. That's the reason why the bill wasn't passed. The number one reason. Nobody, not even you want 5000 a day in here, Bob. Nobody does. That's the reason. And people keep ignoring it. Why? Oh, we had such a great bill. Republicans were all, all on board. What a bunch of crap. 5000 a day. We don't want it. Now, is that better? Yeah, it's a lot better because you didn't okay. single out a caller. There, again, my point is, and it's one of the reasons why some people are reluctant to ever call this program, is because they don't want to say something about a particular topic and then have somebody call in and say, Joe Blow said something and he's totally wrong. You don't need to say somebody is totally wrong or I hate when they say that. Just ignore the desire to criticize another individual and just tell me the topic you want to discuss and tell me what you think about it. No need to, to say you think. You think you're right and somebody else who called is wrong because that discourages some people from calling. And, and also, Bob, there's election. There's an election to be won. We have things to get done. Bob, what we don't want to get done is liberal progressive ideas. That isn't what we want in office. We don't want that pushed on us. We don't want to live that way. This, a small group is liberal progressive. The country does not want to live like a liberal progressive. We don't want their ideas. We don't want them in office. So he's right. We do have an election to win. And it better not be them because we can't live that way anymore. They've been trying. They've been pushing. Marxist, communist, socialist. Harris is, uh, she's uh, Bernie Sanders with hair. That's the best way I can describe her. Uh, just won't work, Bob. Can't have him in office. So can't vote Harris. And again, and too, Bob, how many people hate Trump so much? I mean, they hate him that much that they're willing to vote for an empty suit. They're willing to no, vote for somebody they can't No, I, I'm, I, would, I would submit to you that it's not because they dislike him so much. 
It's because, and 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 not because they dis or like her a lot. It's it's always not always. It seems almost always in recent years when it comes to presidential elections, people are always feeling they have to choose the lesser of two evils. Not because they like one a lot or even not because they hate one over the other. It's just, and some people say, in fact, many people say that they don't want the next four years to be filled with nonstop tweets in bizarro things happening at the rate of like once or twice an hour. Maybe some people are just exhausted. Exhausted. Yeah, maybe. It's all the time we have for today, but don't worry. I'll be back tomorrow morning from 9 to noon. I'm Bob Joseph. You're listening to News Radio WNBF.